corporation seeking to crack melanin Where sci-fi ends on the spectrum of light We begin Hello, and welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4, the legal, the loyal, the regal, the royal, Ronin Ralph, your master of ceremonies. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in and join the channel starting at 99 cents per month for exclusive members-only content right here and only here on T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On today's edition of Ralph Reads, I reintroduce the beloved Sister Soldier, as we also reintroduce our favorite anti-hero of sorts in our guy, Midnight, and his third installment, A Moment of Silence, where he has no problem choosing violence. Passions within shows the man's intents. Let the reading commence. A moment of silence. Something is in the water. Something is in the food. Something is in the atmosphere. Something changed the mood. 
Someone stole the feeling. Someone flipped the beat. There's meanness in the cold air and anger in the heat. Now the souls are empty, the strength gone from our stance. Now most hearts are vacant and feet no longer dance. Knees won't bend for prayer. I can't breathe this air. No one even cares or remembers what was here. Something is now nothing, and ugly is extra bold. Beauty has been stripped away, and only lies are told. We need more than a moment of silence, a year to just reflect, a time to become sincerely humble, truth worthy to live, believe, and protect. By Sister Soldier. Chapter One She is closer to me than my shadow. She's as precious as the sky. In my almost empty Brooklyn apartment, my second wife, Chiesa, aimed and then fired sharpened knives into the corked wall. I had taken everything out of this place, but the cork seemed permanent to my project bedroom. It had served as my target practice for seven years, and unlike me and my family, it did not want to leave. Go stand over there for me, she said sweetly. As she locked her silver gray eyes into mine, I looked at her and said nothing. My smile broke out naturally. Don't smile at me, she said with a straight face. Every time it's time for us to fight, you flash that smile. She must have not figured out that she brought that smile out of me and so much more. It was because of my love for her that I held on to the keys to this place where I wouldn't even allow my mother, Uma, my first wife, Akemi, or my sister, Naja, to ever again step foot. I walked to the corked wall like she wanted. I leaned back, my hands in my jabot jean pockets. She narrowed her eyes and hurled a knife at me. It cut through the still, stale air that was typical in the projects and sliced through my fitted. I didn't flinch. She saw that, and inside of seven seconds she outlined my head and shoulders with eight knives rapidly fired by her quick and accurate combination of eyes and fingers. You're gonna kill me with my own knives, I asked her. She walked towards me slowly until only noses separated her and me. She pulled each knife down from the cork. Now you do me, she said, handing me the knives. Her breasts pressed against my chest, and her unusually long lashes brushed against mine. Boldly, she had become a Muslim woman at the age of 16. She accepted Islam on her own without me asking her to do it or having to recite her any truths from the Holy Quran. She reads the Quran for herself, loves each Suda she studies, and each Ayah she learns. She uses every word in the book to challenge herself to become more beautiful in her wisdom and her deeds. For her to love the faith like any Muslim born on Islamic land and raised with the Muslim example and lifestyle surrounding her made her irresistible to me. When anyone in her family tried to reverse Chiesa's mind, she would politely and calmly reveal her angles of thought and her contentment. Once, one of her aunts said in front of her whole family, A Muslim man can only have more than one wife if he can treat them all equally. No man can treat two, three, four women equally, so that means 
He can really only have one wife. You're supposed to be smart enough to figure it out. It's like a riddle, her aunt said. Chiesa answered softly, correcting her aunt's interpretation. Treat us fairly. No woman wants to be treated equal to another because we are each different. We each enjoy our man in our own way. We each have our own thoughts, likes, dislikes, and hobbies. I don't want my husband to do the exact equal thing he does with his first wife with me or to give me the exact equal gifts he gave her. Why would I want that? I just want him to love me how I, Chiesa, want to be loved. Us sharing the things that are unique to what we feel when we are together. I want us to enjoy and make each other feel good because we believe the same things. I want us to learn, earn, and fight together to be safe, secure, and happy. This is more than enough for me. Those words she spoke shut her one aunt up for some time, and I know she meant it. When we first settled into our new home in Queens, the house that Uma and I purchased with the money that we both earned through our company, Uma Designs, Chiesa chose the smallest bedroom for herself. She set up her bedding on the floor the way she was most comfortable. She lined up her books, mounted her swords, folded her clothes, set up her oils, potions, and creams, brushes, hairpins, and combs, and told me, You are definitely welcome. Come whenever you want to see me. You know I'm from a military family. I'm an expert at waiting. Her words put me at ease. I was always 100 that I could protect and provide for and love her. I never wavered on that. But she made me certain that although we have a teenage marriage and she is my second wife who left behind her parents, her country, and her action-packed life of excitement, she had no regrets and that I made her happy. It felt good that even over time she had zero doubt. Now she was touching my 9 millimeter. I had it laid on the kitchen counter, away from both of us, and towards the wall. We were in my Brooklyn hood, my old apartment, so of course I kept it close. Her clear polished clipped and curved nails and pretty fingers on the black steel aroused me. But the way she held it revealed she didn't have no experience with the piece. Chiesa is a bow and arrow type of girl, not to be taken lightly. She could fire something into you to rock you into a temporary sleep or send you all the way to heaven. Perfect vision. When she fires, she met her mark. Whether it was your brain, your heart, or your family jewels. And she wasn't above poisoning her arrow tip before positioning it just right in her target's jugular. Her target will be coughing up blood, his own veins exploding, then choking him. How come you prefer guns? She asked me playfully, but I could tell she really wanted to know. She wanted to know and feel everything about me. And her inquiries were always subtle and sweet. The way she went about it would have me so open. I'd be telling her something I never shared with no one else. She mixed her curiosity and intellect with her seductions, and it was a powerful potion. I knew what she was really asking me because I know her and her mind. She was thinking, to a ninjutsu warrior, a gun is a weakness. A type of excuse not to use your hands and mind to the furthest degree to confront any enemy and solve the problem, any problem. The gun is the bottom line, I told her. The Japanese don't need them.
Japan is the country that my second wife is from. She's African and Japanese, an exotic combination. I plucked her from a pretty place, a popular park in Tokyo that was filled with green fields, flowers, and a alluring forest. In that forest, there was only one house. Chiesa lived there with only her grandfather, the park ranger. There's peace in your neighborhood and in your country, I told her. Brooklyn brings the noise. Over here, there's certain times and situations where even the swiftest mind and hands move too slow. This block is not so bad looking. I like all the art on the bricks, she said, referring to the hood graffiti. And it's kind of cool how they're setting up for that block party outside today. The music is loud, but it sounds nice, and the people seem like they could become our friends, she said cheerfully. I bet if you didn't suspect them, she said softly, and trusted in them a little bit more, I interrupted her. Don't sleep. These people will easily give a reasonable man a reason to use his trigger finger. I know that men and women were both created by Allah from one same soul. Yet I also know that men and women are different. Chiesa, the woman, is friendly, loving, emotion-filled, and hopeful. Besides, she's foreign to my Brooklyn hood, or any hood for that matter. She's a capable female fighter, but she's also innocent and naive, and likely to underestimate evil. She and I are married, similar in some ways and in deep love, but I am a man born and trained to observe, detect, and perceive all potential threats, to defend, guard, protect, or attack, and eliminate all real enemies who don't understand any language other than the rat-a-tat-tat or the boom of my milli. I have killed before for these same reasons. Chiesa had competed in sword fighting and martial arts and won. She has fought, poisoned, injured, and intercepted some enemies in real-life conflict, but she has never killed. Now that she's my wife, she won't have to. I'm here for the sole purpose of protecting and providing for and loving my women, and in the future, for raising my sons to do the same for their women and families, inshallah. Guns seem messy, she continued her soft expressions while caressing the steel. They make too much noise. She held it now with both hands. The silent kill is superior, she said. I have a silencer, I told her. I don't leave it lying around. If you get snagged with it, you do seven extra years separate from the gun possession charges. Seven years? She said. That's too long. And separate from the other charges, that's too much. She retreated to silence for some seconds returning the gun to its position on the counter and pulling back her palms. Then her eyes shifted from the gloom of that thought. You know what I want? She asked, her eyes searching me now, to see if I was giving her question real thought and if I was sharp enough to guess. I was listening carefully now. I wanted to know all of her wants. Everything she wanted right now, and even in the future. I would be the one who was getting it for her. Eliminating her need to need another human beside me. Even her father. A crossbow. Have you seen one? It's cleverly designed. A quiet, thorough, neater, cleaner weapon, but still super deadly. She sounded like she was describing herself. What would you do with that? I asked her. Run out into the woods, she said. Now she held her pretty arms in position as though she was firing her crossbow. 
I climb a mountain, track down the bad guys, monsters, and witches, or avenge anyone who try to take what I love. She approached me, then pressed her thick, moist, and warm lips onto mine. My tongue moving over her tongue, our heads tilted, and there was only our breathing, sucking, and sincerity mixing with our silence. Her black silk Yucata dress was easily released. She knew when she put it on this morning as we trekked and trained over here to Brooklyn what we came to do. My place in the projects was more of a hut than a palace. It definitely wasn't a nature-filled beautifully blossoming gardens and forests where she had lived. This was an all-cemented place that couldn't compare to the wilderness that she and I had traveled through together, or to eventually climbing over the mountains of Hokkaido as we fell in love. I knew her soul still craved all of that adventure we had shared, but I also knew that my hut in the projects was where I am right now. And as long as I am anywhere, she would willingly and voluntarily choose to be right beside me. Bare backs and bare butts, we were both in the living room now, on the warm hard floor, sitting in the spotlight from the powerful sun. Our sauna was natural. The living room windows were shut tight. Chiesa began gently rocking her pretty thighs from side to side, releasing her subtle scent. I watched, wanted to make her wait, while observing her dark brown soul been swelling on her golden breasts. I knew she wouldn't like me staying still, and staring because this was her exclusive time with me alone, and she cherished it. She started kicking me playfully. Only our feet fought. I cheated, grabbing hold of her right ankle and dragging her. She began laughing, but still tried to leap up with her left. Off balance, she fell. I broke her fall, and our bodies were entangled. I reached back and snatched from off the floor the cloth belt from a yukata. Oh no, you don't. She raised her voice playfully at what she smartly suspected she had coming. We tussled. I won. Her hands were now tied behind her back. She liked it. I flipped her, then licked her left hole, and then her right. I pulled back. Don't stop. She whispered. I knew her nubes were super sensitive. I began to open only us and not the other. I moved my hand down her curves and rested it on her waist. Stop playing, she begged. I moved my hand between her thighs and she moaned. I pushed my thickest finger and her walls locked around it tightly and thumped rhythmically. When I began kissing her, she was breathing hard but still tried to launch a sneak attack and flip me with her feet. I'm smiling. Don't smile at me, she said, trying to mount me because I hadn't mounted her. We wrestled. My stiff steel joint didn't give a f about the game I was playing. In moments, I was deep her for I sniffed. Pushing and thrashing, and the feeling was so extreme. I love you. Her lips passionately pushed out, causing me to f*** 
her the way I knew she needed to be f***ed in that moment. We were moving and feeling and changing positions and postures. Warmer than warm, our emotions were heavy like that, and only our breathing was heavier. Our mutual deep attraction, our mutual deep admiration, our mutual deep love, loyalty, and deep affection, our mutual faith, feelings, and friendship all exploded, and I kept pouring her whose name. She was quiet now, still shaking from her own eruption. She turned on her side to face me. So I faced her, watching her slide her slim finger in the sheen of my sweat. One of us should open that window, she said. Her silky Japanese hairstyle turned into a long, wild African bush. Me digging it either way because it's all her. Checking her out, I eased up, reminding her that we are both naked. She sat up. I know. She said sweetly. I kissed her, just pushed my lips against hers. Her now relaxed soul then turned into kilometer olives. In less than one second, we were both swelling again, and she leapt at me. Her hips spread in my lap, and I touched her up until I was doing sit-ups between her thighs. Chiesa, my second wife, was no longer the unknowing virgin I had first met. She was swinging those hips completely comfortable with our naked bodies. She craved that friction and would have an outburst when her feeling reached an unbearable high. Her voice echoed in my mostly empty apartment where she and I needed to be alone to get wild and dive all the way into our thing. Her second shaking, and I was sure she wasn't done. Athletic and competitive, she has endurance. Yet in her eyes, I saw a complete surrendering to me. From a 16 years young feline fighter, unaccustomed to surrendering. How come I love you so much? She asked me intensely, as if she needed to have an answer from herself. I love you more than Kanichi, she said. Kanichi is our American mare, a horse her father brought her, which she left behind in Japan after I married her. You love me more than your beast? I smiled, saying it loud so she could hear how it translated in my ear. She laughed a little too, then stopped smiling. I love you more than my mother, she said, pushing each word out from her heart. The air thickened and the room fell silent, even with the music from the streets thumping outside our closed windows. We both knew she meant it. She'd never say anything she didn't mean. And for words that strong and heavy, silence was my only response. She knew I couldn't wrap my mind around ever considering the depth of my love for my mother, Uma. Nor had I ever, or would I ever, or could I ever compare my love for Uma to my love for any other human. Still, her magnetic confession moved me, and I was making love to her now deeper feeling than f***ing. So deep, it felt like a high-pitched sound. So high, it could cause all eardrums to pop, then bleed. 
a feeling so meaningful it could push life into existence and hurl the two lovers ten years into the future within seconds. I Siros built her lost and made her come so hard she gasped and exhaled some sounds I had only ever heard in the jungle of South Sudan. Word. Happy birthday, I said. Her seventeenth birthday was one week away, but she and I were celebrating it in the only time we had available to be alone. I wasn't big on birthdays, mine or anybody else's, but she was that special to me. She looked into me and said in a soft, slow, sultry way, I love you more than my father. Time stood still. I couldn't move. She couldn't move. Even our eyes couldn't blink. Even the boom of the 808 bass that shook the speakers on the outdoor sound system shut down. The turntable needle got stuck and could only repeat a piece of the beat. For a split second, it seemed that even the fire-filled, brilliant sun had blacked out. Unique, her unusualness attracted me. Twelve clocks, ten phone cards, and a huge lighted spinning globe were the first purchases of my second wife, Kieza Yoku Brown, as we moved into our new home in the borough of Queens, state of New York. I just took her to the stores where I knew the items she wanted to buy could be purchased, then watched as she walked around choosing carefully and intently. Of course I carried her choices, her boxes, and bags for her. She accumulated enough for me to go out and hail a cab and have the driver pop the trunk. In her first floor bedroom in our home, she lined her AAA battery operated clocks on the shelf after setting each one. They were all the same model, but she set each of them to a different time. Where do you want the globe? I asked. One minute, she said as she began pulling books from a big box, rushing to stack and organize them on the floor. I should have bought you a table for this, I said, as I realized she was using the books to build a stand. This is good enough. These are the books I've already read, she said. She read them, but couldn't leave them behind, I thought to myself, so I knew then how she felt about her books. I set the globe up on the book stand she built, plugged it in, and it glowed, colorfully outlining most of the territories on Earth. Helping her with these little things was a small task for me. Yet, like the moon, she glowed with a grateful smile. On a short stack of same-size encyclopedias sat her baby blue colored phone. Slim and feminine, it was curved nicely with glow-in-the-dark push buttons. She called it her, quote-unquote, blue phone. It was her own hardline hotline with a separate number from our house phone or our Uma Designs business phone. Only she can use her blue phone, and that was on purpose. Daddy will call me tonight at 11 p.m. It will be the end of the night here in New York. It will be 11 in the morning over in Tokyo. It will be 5 a.m. in London, England, 8 p.m. in Los Angeles, California, and 8 a.m. the next day in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. It will be 3 a.m. in Antwerp, Belgium, and in Zurich, Switzerland, and 6 a.m. in Johannesburg, South Africa. She pointed to each clock that she had set. And in Antarctica, she said. I smiled and repeated, Antarctica. She laughed and said, I was just checking to see if you were listening. So we bought 12 clocks, so you can know what time it is in all of the regions of the world, I said. But it was more of an observation than a question. 
Hi, she said softly in her energetic way, meaning yes in her Japanese language. Daddy never says exactly where he is, but he will tell me which country he's in. I look to the country up on the globe so I know where he is and exactly what's surrounding him and what time zone it has. And if by chance he's going to be in a certain place for more than one night, and if he is willing to give me his phone number, I can use these phone cards. And that way, I won't run up a big phone bill. Then I can check these clocks to know exactly what time it is where Daddy is stationed. That way, I won't accidentally wake him when he sleeps. She exhaled, not being used to so much talking, except when she is excited about her father. I just looked at her, attracted to her passion yet very aware of her anxious and deep love for a six-foot-eight black-skinned African-American brute of a father, a man of fifty faces who only showed his daughter one, and she believed that was the only face he had. She spoke about him with great affection as though he was her teddy bear and her anchor and her hero. Daddy! who called her every other day at any time he wanted to with no consideration for our schedule or our time zone, sometimes only had ten seconds of convo to share. He'd say, I just wanted to hear your voice and be sure you're happy and okay. Daddy, who had a serious weak spot for his daughter, who he could hardly ever see in person because of his work. So he filled the absence of his presence in her life with presents. Expensive gifts given on each of her birthdays and on selected Christian holidays. He gifted her anything she asked him for with only one rule. She couldn't ask him to come home on any particular day at any particular time. He would come on his schedule, unannounced, and by his own choice. My wife marked time by her father's presence and presence and absences. The presents were gifts that no young husband, who, although he is a hard worker and is steadily building his business, could match. Daddy, a general in the American military. Daddy, who had declared war on me when he realized his daughter's heart had been swept away by a young Muslim man who was born on the other side of his world. Daddy, who played deadly games with my life because he could. Daddy, whose last words to me before I left Asia with his beautiful 16 years young daughter who I wifed were, Take care of my daughter or I'll find you and kill you. Now his daughter, who is definitely my wife, lay naked on the hot floor beside me on her early 17th birthday party, with her pretty fingers, kissing me lightly with her pretty lips, hypnotizing me with her pretty eyes, and stroking my calves with her pretty toes, saying she loved me more than him. My presence had outdistanced his presence, and our intimacy was an area where he naturally could never go, and our closeness was sealed, a bond never to be broken. The metal tapping against the metal door on lock time. Uh-uh. No. Chiesa said seductively. No one was supposed to knock on my project apartment door. Even when my family lived here, no one did. And for the time that Chiesa and I had been coming here, no one else came, and no one else was invited. She licked my lips, and her tongue f***ing delighted me. Just as I moved to her, a voice within me ordered me to get up. Chiesa leapt up a fourth of a second after me and began collecting her clothes from the living room floor. I nodded for her to go into my bedroom. 
I stepped into my basketball shorts, then my jeans. Easing up the metal shutter of the peephole, I saw hazel eyes, black lashes, and a red hijab. It was Sudana, a 16 years young Sudanese girl who lives way out in the Bronx. But now she was standing alone on the other side of my door in the dark, dangerous corridor of my Brooklyn project. Uninvited. I never gave her this address, and she had never ever been here before. I felt a bad feeling as I quickly unlocked and yanked open the door. Uma was all I said to her. She smiled calmly and said, Your Umi is perfectly fine. She's still at my house with my mom at the woman's meeting. Relieved that my sudden and dark intuition was wrong and this was not an emergency and that my mother was safe, as she should be, I turned my attention to Sudana, waiting to hear her reason for coming and what she wanted. Are you going to continue to block the entrance or will you invite me in? She asked. Actually, I wanted her to disappear, leave so I could get back to my wife. I knew I had to be cautious, though, and careful, and courteous. Sudana and my mother are close. Sudana's father and I had done good business together, and for the time that I had recently been traveling in Asia, Sudana's whole family had taken care of my Uma and my sister Naja for more than a month. I owed her to be grateful. I saw her eyes moving over my chest, admiring my body. In haste, I was shirtless, unzipped, and beltless, sockless. I stepped back from the door so she could enter. I locked it behind her, then quickly picked up my t-shirt and pulled it on. When I turned back to her, she was unwrapping her hijab, which in our faith and in this situation was forbidden. There was no blood relation between us, and I was a man who could marry her, and she was an unmarried young woman. Her long hair was shining like she taxied over here, fresh from the salon. She was watching for my reaction. Now that she had showed me what I had never seen before, I gave off nothing. I knew she felt it. She moved her eyes slowly around the living room. First, she looked back toward the front door. She paused on Chiesa's kicks, neatly placed against the wall. She turned again, her eyes landing on Chiesa's bangles lying on the counter next to the slingshot that she keeps strapped around her right thigh beneath her skirt of her yakuta. She paused over the bento box Chiesa had packed and stacked with some foods from a project picnic, quote-unquote. Then Sudana stood staring at the only half-closed bedroom door. She twisted her body slightly, and her gaze landed on my 9 millimeter, then eased back to me. She had a serious stare now that she had surveyed everything. Her eyes were moving over me. The love that she was searching for in me wasn't there. My heart was full, and the scent of my wife's and my lovemaking still hung in the stagnant air. Perceptive, Sudana switched from speaking the English she had been using to speaking only in Arabic. She realized Chiesa was here with me and somewhere listening closely. She also knew that Chiesa could not speak or understand Arabic, but of course I could. Chiesa remained quiet and out of sight. Even that aroused me. I need to speak some private words just for your ears, she said in Arabic. You could have waited to tell me whatever you have to tell me when I pick a boomer up from your house later on, I said in Arabic. It's not smart or safe for you to just show up here. I walked over and picked up her hijab. 
put it on, I told her. Then I heard the shower splash on in my bathroom. My mind switched. I pictured Chiesa naked in the downpour. Can you do that same thing to me that you did to me on our first time? Chiesa had asked me. All this time, I had been walking around believing that I was doing everything right and that these other non-believing girls were all wrong. Sudana said. I didn't like her referring to my second wife, who was not born into Islam, but who was Muslim by choice, as kafir, meaning non-believer, in Arabic. Sudana continued in Arabic with soft, but strong emphasis and attitude. But I figured out, when you came back from Japan with wife number two, that these other girls must have been right all along, and I must have been wrong. Sudana, I interrupted her. No, please let me finish, she said. I've been waiting to say this for more than a month. I've been slowly getting up the nerve. I've been waiting for the opportunity where I could speak directly to you, just the two of us, but the chance never happened. We were always surrounded by so many. The whole time since you and I first met, I was doing everything you wanted and everything you asked me to do and caring for your Uma as much as my own mother, even after you returned from Asia, shocking me with the second wife, acting all calm, cool, and casual. Sudana's voice stayed in a controlled tone, but her emotion was rising, so I let her get it all out. It didn't matter. If anything she was saying was against Chiesa as my second wife, she was walking down a dead end. I met Chiesa in the sky, somewhere over the Siberian mountains. She was asleep on a flight, wearing her naturally long cornrows braided like streaks of lightning. Between her breasts was a gold first place medal. When Chiesa and I stood face to face and eye to eye in Narita Airport, processing through customs, the thought that came to me and dropped directly into my mind about Chiesa was, she seems like a gift from Allah. And if Allah had given me Chiesa, only Allah could take her away. La Kada Allah. God forbid. Sudana will have to chill and learn that she couldn't love me by force or keep a count or a scorecard, somehow declaring herself the winner. True, I'd always known Sudana is a beautiful Sudanese young woman who had feelings for me, but the timing between me and her was always off. You couldn't see me when I was covered. You overlooked me, so I wanted to give you a chance to see me clearly. Holding the fabric of her hijab in one hand. Take a look, she said, peeling off a light jacket. The one I'm sure she had to wear to get past her mother and father and brother's inspection. And besides them, all of the Sudanese women at that meeting in that basement apartment of her house. Her red but sheer blouse showcased the cut of her satin bra and perfect figure. She spun around slowly, her jeans hugging her hips, her feet turning in her new red heels, which she wrongly and defiantly didn't remove when she walked in there. Oh, these, she said, stepping out of those red heels. Same as I stepped into them, I could step out of them. Her toes were revealed, red polish dusted with crystals. I eased my eyes up and away from her feet. Still, she stood posing and clutching her new red coat saddlebag. Here I am, Sudana Salim Ahmed Ghazali, from our country, speaking our language from our people. A believer, a Muslim, same as you, Muslim. There can't be anything wrong with any of that. I know those are things that you like, the same things that you love about your mother, Uma. The only thing left has to be that you didn't see me, because I was always covered. You didn't notice that Ana la mina. I'm prettier than her. She continued in Arabic, referring to Chiesa by shifting her eyes to the back room. Then Sudana uttered, I'm more beautiful than both of them. Referring also to my first wife, Akemi. Chiesa came hurrying out of the back bedroom in her black lace bra and matching panties, her yukata half on, half off. 
in a frenzy. She tied her black yukata and dove for her black pumas. I saw Naja outside running, Kieza said, now down on one knee, tying her laces. It couldn't be Naja. I left her downstairs indoors with Miss Marcy, Sudana said with confidence. Naja told me that she missed Miss Marcy. She was speaking to my back, because I was already out the door. It didn't matter what Sudana said. Kieza had perfect vision. I was 100 that whatever my wife said she saw, she saw. I had my little sister Naja in my first mind, my Nikes on my feet, my nine in my hand. I was on a stairwell, bulbs were broken, and it was darkened. I was headed down. Chapter 2 Sometimes it's in the wind when men walk by one another, moving in opposite directions. I could feel it way back when, that I would murder him. It was just a matter of time, motivation, and just cause. I could sense that he would throw me a reason. Murder, not kill. A person could be killed in a car accident or in a storm or a fire, or by choking on a fishbone. Murder is different. It's getting slaughtered with full intent. It's getting gritty and gruesome, hacked up, eyes plucked, punched, or blown out of their sockets, sliced open and skinned, organs ripped out from their flesh frame, hands twisted off at the wrists, neck severed from the head, Head blown to bits and pieces. There are men who deserve to be murdered. To kill them would be too compassionate. 97 aggressive degrees outside, same day, in the same place, my old Brooklyn block. Except now, it's 9 p.m. The sweltering orange sun refused to settle. The 3,000 strong block party was officially over an hour ago. The fire department captain and the DJ were in an intense standoff. The captain had the authority, but the DJ had crowd control. Long as he was spinning the cuts, ain't nobody leaving the jam. The Brooklyn crowd shouted and roared with a rapping rhythm. Don't stop the music! 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 Don't stop, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. A suited public official over a megaphone kept reminding everyone of his name and status, crediting himself. He thanked everyone for coming to his community event and repeatedly asked the crowd to break up peacefully so the cleaning crew could do his job. He let the high pitched sound leak a little and then deaded it, but kept the red light spinning. And now cops and other cruisers did the same, a chain reaction of lights and sound. Now there was movement. Now even I was milling, my eyes speeding over grills and grimaces, t-shirts and kicks, jewels and scars, and watching all hands, all pockets, and all men moving, knowing at least one of them was going to get murked and die before midnight. The hood was all hip-hop. But there was only one joint playing in my head. In the Air Tonight by Phil Collins. The truth of the track, the lyrics and the music accelerated my anger as it mixed with my usual calmness and precision. Anger overtook me and then turned to pure fury. My state of mind was explosive. It was burning.
burning hot outside. I'm hot-headed, but now my heart is ice cold. N not ninja. Cause ninjas manage their emotions, eliminate rage, and deliver with ease the takedown of the target at the opportune time and without leaving a trace. But this was too personal to organize, calculate calmly, or put off for wiser plan or perfect opportunity, and definitely not for another day. No matter what, in these moments, I could not separate myself from my fury. Suddenly, the moon eclipsed the sun and darkness dropped down disguised as a subtle gray, then drifted into deep black. I didn't have my silencer on me, but my nine was tucked with one in the chamber. So heated out of my usual posture, I didn't give a fuck about the boom of my burner. Only about the execution. Shoulder to shoulder, with many men moving like a stampede on the Sahara. A pack of hood hyenas cut across the flow of the movement, diagonally in front of me. Girls grouped up like desert foxes, wearing bleached out jeans and fresh kicks, tight tees, and hair gelled, followed close behind. A young mother held one baby in her left arm while walking a four-year-old with her right hand who dropped the pacifier. Instinctively, I squatted to scoop it, handed it to a young son, and saw one lion moving behind her turn left and another lion turn right. And over the kid's shoulder, the approach of my target was revealed. Sideways. He was the sidewinder type, a poisonous viper that usually sneaks around rapidly, sliding sideways across the desert effortlessly. Closer now, he saw me squatted there with my milli in my grip. He froze. His own frightened feet were f***ing him over. Shook. He was empty-handed and solo. The nasty sh** he did, he had to do alone. He did it. He knew it. I knew it. He knew that I knew. In his eyes was fear. His left eye was bandaged where Chiesa's razor thin and lethally sharp blade had already caught him. I leapt, punched him hard in his injury. He raised his fist in the aftershock. I punched him in the stomach. Big, slow, and stupid. He had left it unguarded. All those jail push-ups and that bench pressing gave him the look, but not the technique. His body buckled from the blow. His jaw dropped open. Speeding, I shoved my barrel in his mouth. Made him spit all me. He pushed back, but couldn't move me. As he reached for me, he choked on my black steel. I squeezed off six in him to make sure only he swallowed the bullets and no one else in the crowd. I never want innocent blood on my hands. Now his face was mangled and soaking in the blood of his brains. His whole body was jumping, shaking, in a jerking motion like a worm with his head cut off. His intestines were blown out of his sides. His blood was mixing with his pee and his sh** which splattered and stained and stunk. There was also smoke. He wanted to be hood famous. Now he was beyond recognition. Now he would only be known for the last six seconds of his life for peeing 
and shitting out of a fear in his guest jean shorts till smoke came out and for getting hunted and slaughtered on the block like a beast. More shots were fired. Not from me, but they sounded not too far away. Familiar, I figured young cubs were shooting into the air just to f*** with the cops for shutting down the sound system. A bottle got thrown from the roof, smashed open, and caused a ripple in the crowd. Here come the Jake! Someone hollered from the window ledge. It was as though everybody out here had shot him dead, cause some started running and bumping into others who already had been running since the split seconds that the six fatal shots got fired. Mamas were hanging out of open project windows like curious monkeys. Some hood heads stay still, chilling, like they was huge elephants who owned the block, the building, and the people, blocking the path of police on purpose while acting like they wasn't doing what they was doing. Another mother covered her young daughter's eyes with the palm of her hand so she wouldn't see what she would probably see many times more if they stayed living on my street. A small crowd surrounded the dead body like circling vultures, talking, laughing, some shocked, but nobody crying. Now the switched-on sirens were screaming, so no one in the crowd could hear themselves thinking or speaking or being spoken to. The stage crowd, politicians, and performers had scattered like rodents, nearly knocking one another over to escape the audience, the violence, the smoke. The police cruisers were deadlocked in the chaos of the party, and street exits and entrances were blocked off by them. So they charged like heavy-hooved wild pigs where they must have believed the body was stewing. Searching for the shooter must have been crazy. Staring into the sea of faces that all, quote-unquote, fit the description. Young, black, real black, armed and dangerous. For them, that's every man moving. I lowered the hood of my black champion sweatshirt. Don't react. You move the action. Make your enemy react to you. I heard my father's voice in my head. I eased my right hand into my right pocket to remove my glove. Brownsville. Never ran. Never will. So I walked. My millie tucked till I could toss it. The burning hot barrel feeling like it was branding my black skin blacker. I was walking casually, unloading my adrenaline, dismissing my doubts, regrets, and disappointment that I should have made his murder more brutal and even more painful for him. Maybe I should have stayed and skinned him alive then hung his dead body from the street light to let regular motherfuckers on the block know to stop letting foul n****s live. Persecution is worse than slaughter. A line from a suda in the Holy Kudan moved through my mind. Maybe I should have tortured him. Now, the police were surrounding the body, pushing the crowd back and pulling out the chalk and yellow tape. A few of them dashed into the crowd in different directions. Last look, the cluttered crowd was thinning. I wouldn't be looking back no more, just facing forward, keeping an even pace as most scrambled. Now, I was politely passing by the parked in the middle of the street police bus. The doors were flung open. Soon they would sweep and pile randomly cuffed up, roughed up prisoners in there and haul them off. I had already put distance between me and them. Dropped down between two parallel parked cars two blocks over, 
I tossed my nine in the iron slotted gutter after wiping it down with the white washcloth that I normally rocked in my back pocket. The cops would want the murder weapon. I wouldn't make it easy for them. I'd force them to get low, crawl into the gutter with the fist-sized water bugs and their rat rivals. The men in blue were already dirty. I'd make them get filthy, wade in the water, and inhale the stench of the Project Toilet shit. Police, stop! I heard as I raised up. I didn't stop, didn't turn. Just walked swiftly to the nearest subway station. Shook one's turn when they hear those two words, afraid they'll get shot in the back by the Glock. I have zero fear. I believe that when it is my turn to return to Allah, I will. Fear was trained out of me from when I was young enough to walk on this earth. Fear only Allah. Terror, not fear, had gripped me though when I was out checking the whole length and width of my hood. Looking in the front, sides, and back of the buildings, searching down shortcuts and alleyways. Peering through car windows and parking lots and even climbing up the dumps where trash is heaped up high. The terror of hurting my Uma's heart, our mother. The terror of losing my little sister. Oh Allah. The terror of her becoming ruined and raped and unprotected like too many fatherless American girls. The terror of her losing her honor, of me failing my father, my culture, and my faith. Terror had soaked through my pores and seized me when I had seen a body laid out and white-sheeted and being carried to the ambulance only to overhear people saying, it was some old lady from the building who caught a heat stroke and died. As I looked everywhere and walked and searched in every direction from my Brooklyn building, my terror made my head get even hotter, and it felt like my own blood was boiling up my body organs. I reversed it on the cops by acting and not reacting. Made the cops doubt their suspicion of me by never looking back or over my shoulders and by remaining calm, detached, looking straight forward and keeping it moving. As my feet moved down the subway stairs, I felt a second set of feet were stepping in my same rhythm directly behind me. On the subway platform, I moved in and out of the outgoing crowd until the train stormed in. I stepped into the second to last car with a group of random riders. Doors closed. Train pulled out. I was heading to the dirty door that connects one train car to the next, thinking that either way, I had achieved my objective, to move the action away from my Brooklyn block, where I had lived for seven years. My hood, where I was often seen, but never known. Where I had fought, but never mixed or mingled. Investigate me. No one there had ever known my name. Midnight was the only name some could use or tell. My Umi, my sister, and both my wives lived safely elsewhere outside of the borough of Brooklyn, forwarding a dress unknown by even my closest, truest friends, Shala. Looking through a backwards reflection cast on a dirty train door window, my eyes were scanning movements and faces. They paused on someone lovely, exotic, and familiar. My heart skipped half a beat before fast-forwarding. It was not time for love or longing, only for carrying out the plan to its completion. In this plan, there are no comrades on purpose. I'm strictly solo. Hibernate the heart, my sensei had taught me. In extreme situations, or in captivity, isolation, or torture, only the hibernated heart will allow the fighter to prevail. Again my eyes paused, then doubled back to confirm what I sensed. d -tech. Undercover detectives were only undercover to themselves. 
The street-trained eye could see them clearly. On my side of Brooklyn, they were usually black like us. But they were different from everyday street cats. They didn't have the swagger or the rhythm of the full-blown, bold, and ignorant zigging. They lacked style, wore the wrong fitteds and bogus jewels, which could only be wrong. Worn too long kicks is always dead wrong, because we either clean them or trash them when they get marks or specks on them. That's why we walk like we stepping on air when we sport them. Even our laces had to be flawless. The D's lacked ease. They were uncomfortable with themselves, uncomfortable with their jobs, and uncomfortable in our hoods, even if they came from them. Train stopped. Doors open. I saw the D was still sitting, staring in my direction at the back of my head. Would he get off? He didn't. Seemed like he was waiting to see if I would. I didn't. He sat fingering his pager, looking into the slim screen. He stood up, one hand grabbing hold of the overhead strap while the train shook slightly as it moved forward while still pulling left to right. He was facing my direction. Took one step toward me and then... Seven shots. Sounded like a two two caliber. Nah, not a twenty two. It was firecrackers with the fuses connected to make them fire off rapidly and sound lethal. Then a stick bomb was let off. The smell of the smoke fogged the air and the train car lights went black for half a second as they often do. Fire flared up in the opposite corner from me. Remain calm, a male voice shouted excitedly as the riders jeered and scrambled. Only one man seated and wearing headphones didn't panic. His head was bobbing rhythmically to the music he must have been listening to. There was only one way to go, toward the dirty door that I was blocking. Glass broke and someone sprayed the extinguisher and another pulled the red wooden handle of the emergency stop rope. The train jerked hard and screeched and screamed to a halt. The crowd that was pressed against me fell backwards, lights off again suddenly. In the coughing, cursing, and confusion, I opened and shot through the door past a pissy homeless man laid out on the seat who I couldn't see but could smell. I dropped down from the last train car and onto the train tracks. All New Yorkers know, pull the red emergency stop rope and the train gets stuck for a long time. Still, they stay put, scared of getting electrocuted or suffocated out in the train tunnel where only the young wild wolves would venture. An A train recently got stuck and some Wall Street regulars got the shakedown. Wallets, jewels, cash, coins, and even eyeglasses, shoes, and technology. They made them run it all and escape through the tunnel. Now the subways in all five boroughs were crawling with police at every platform. Walking through the darkness and cutting through the thick fumes that substituted for air in the underground, I was headed on foot to the next station without the train, without the crowd, without the detect. There was one urgent thing that I had to do now that I wasn't comfortable doing until after I had finalized the execution. Chapter 3 36 minutes after midnight and four 9mm aimed at my head and my heart. Two police dogs, more like wolves, or tigers trained on dark meat and human bones were standing still and strong on their long leather leashes. Three NYPD, one undercover, two transit police, and a small crowd collecting as six more NYPD came storming down the subway stairs. Far too many cops, I thought to myself, to arrest one man for the murder of a nobody. Everybody else is still. Still, they shouted. 
You are under arrest! A stern and stout uniformed cop barked at me, face to face, as another patted me down asking me, Do you have any weapons on you? No response for me, so he picked up his speed searching my ankles, back and front pockets, and all the places where any man could conceal a weapon. Don't you hear an officer talking to you? A solid, broad-backed policeman slammed me in the stomach with his nightstick as the one searching me pulled my box cutter out of my side left pocket. He's clean, nothing but a box cutter, the searching cop said, and he's only got six dollars on him. Impossible, the stern and stout arresting officer told him. Get down on your knees, the broad-backed nightstick cop ordered me. And put your hands behind your head! Now he had both hands around his gun instead of his nightstick. The stick for when he thought I was guilty of possessing a concealed weapon. His gun drawn for after he was sure I was not carrying a weapon. I stayed standing. A young-looking, frightened, rookie-type cop leapt over with a swiftness and stung me. A strong electric current ran through each of my veins. As my body overheated, my legs began to buckle, and the broad back cop forced me down with his nightstick. His gun now in his left hand, the nightstick in his right. I was not on my knees, but was face down on the pavement. He put his foot on my spine using his heavy shoe and shifting his weight to press and hold me there. He pushed his nightstick against the back of my neck to be sure my face was mashed into the filth of the pissy subway cement. The stern and stout cop yanked my hands behind my back and cuffed me. The other officers began to huddle as the broad-backed nightstick cop shouted orders to disperse the small late-night crowd. He didn't want any witnesses as he attempted to crush me to death. The two unleashed tigers approached me. In the haze, I watched the cops observe their canines' every action, eager for them to send even a slight signal. The police dog sniffed me, but didn't bark or growl or roar. They searched the area surrounding me. Disappointed, 90 seconds later, the cops called their loyal dogs back. You have the right to remain silent, the stern arresting cop explained. Silence, I thought to myself. In the flash of a second, I don't believe there is one American who knows what that is. They are a nation of chatterers, speaking even when there's nothing good, right, or true to say. Talking non-stop trash and completely unfamiliar with the pause. Even when the greatest American tragedies occur, they can only reserve and observe a moment of silence. Now the Black Leopard of Sudan will show them the true power and meaning of silence. NYPD and transit cops and even the plainclothes detectives argued over who caught me. Caught me, I thought to myself. Even after just having been electrocuted with the taser, I was clear that I had walked right down into their nest on my own two feet, of my own free will. The fool who needed murdering, I had already murdered with full intent and zero regret and the second and final deed I had to do had already been done. I had no plans to take down no cops, even though I could have waged war against them till the end. I could have run and hid myself away in any number of places. I have a house of love in Queens, where my women welcome me warmly, respect me, enjoy me, love me, and serve me. I have my two closest friends, Chris and Amir, who would have both put me up till the heat was off me, or at least till it died down. But a true man never leads a trail of pain or war to his own house or to the homes of his loved ones. Men fight. Men work. Men defend. Men murder. Ninja-trained warriors burn their trail and all traces 
that jeopardize their team, territory, or goals. I know the deal. Now that I have done what had to be done, I'm like mercury or radiation to all who know and love me. I made a conscious and clear decision. I understood the seriousness. Now I need all pain and punishment to fall only on my shoulders. I need for my sister and mother and wives to be untouched, unseen, uninterrupted, and unknown to anyone who we and they have not chosen to be a part of our world. I need family and friends to stay far away from me. Further, I need not even one of them to attempt to see, talk to, or even contact me, not even by letter. They each should deny that they ever knew me, treat me like I'm dead, and remain completely silent until I hit time served and my hands, mind, heart, and body are all free. Anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law, the cop said. The law, I thought to myself. How can there be a law without trust between the lawmakers and the people? People don't even expect to ever be protected by the law. People don't even expect their loved ones to ever be protected by the law. People don't expect justice from the law. People don't ever expect the lawmakers to obey the laws they made. So there is no law. Just bandits with authority versus bandits without authority. Now I was in the cruiser. Not cruising, but cuffed and uncomfortable. One blew to my left, the same cop who first searched me. One blew to my right, the young frightened rookie. Nightstick blue was driving up front. The stern stout blue was riding shotgun. Loud police radio reports and orders coming in and out. No oxygen in the car. Just heat. Serious-faced cops. Even their body language and breathing was pure intimidation. How does it feel, asshole? The nice dick cop broke the silence. I was blank-faced and face in front. Can you believe this, f***er? The same cop, the driver said. He doesn't show us the respect of a response, even though he's caught in our monkey trap. They all laughed. I think the n*** deaf, the searching cop right beside me announced, loud and clear in my ear. I didn't flinch. Must be, the arresting stern cop said. We'll have to talk to him with our fists and guns. He'll understand that, he threatened. And the backseat cops chuckled. No, seriously, you know Officer Maldonado, the Spanish guy with the deaf sister who only speaks in grunts? He's sensitive about all the handicaps. He was on foot post, telling this perpetrator right here, said he showed no signs that he could hear what was happening around him. Maldonado is supposed to apprehend this guy. He protects him instead, lets the perp walk right out in front of him and disappear into thin air. F***er might be deaf, but he ain't blind. When I had my 9mm pointed at his head and told him to get down, he dropped like a prostitute, nightstick cop said. They all broke out in laughter. I didn't move. Silence is discipline. Even when being provoked, lied to, lied on, insulted, and maligned, I just want to thank him for the overtime. I'm ready to question him all night, the rookie blue said. Me too, the searching cop agreed. I'm thinking these big white boy cops ain't from Brooklyn. The way they talking and their accents, they weren't from any close by place. Probably poor white boys from upstate farms who caught a job that armed them then paid them more than they could ever earn from their own intelligence. Police cruiser I'm in gets cut off by a speeding black Plymouth. All heads yank forward, then slam backwards after the nightstick cop driver reacted to the shock and rammed the brakes, barely avoiding a collision. He said as he jumped out of the cruiser at the same time as his front seat partner. Don't move! Left blue in the back seat warned me with heated anxiety. Or you'll end up in the morgue!
The crooked cruiser was paused right there in the middle of the street, blocking all cars behind us. Both backseat cops remained seated on either side of me. The two trash-talking blues began barking on the two Plymouth pushers soon as they jumped out of their vehicle. They were all shouting and strapped. All cops! All four of them, I thought, while watching their every move through the cruiser windshield. Otherwise, the uniformed cops would have popped and locked them two plainclothes ones easily for speeding through the red light, for cutting off the cop cruiser and causing a traffic foul up, and even for getting out of their Plymouths, walking towards the uniformed cops and looking them in their eyes and mouthing off. If the two Plymouth guys were not cops, if they were regular civilians, the cops would have killed them for that handful of violations. Killed them first and called it justifiable later. Now the two blues beside me opened their back doors. Each placed one foot on the ground but didn't get out. The rookie cop was on his walkie-talkie calling for backup. I observed that frightened cops are the most dangerous. Their fears and their imagination link up, and before you know it, there will be bodies everywhere. The uniform blue who had arrested me was chest to chest with the plainclothes cop. Hey, back off! This is ours! We cuffed and collared him! His partner yelled as the four, who had already been arguing, were now shoving one another around and about to go to blows. Some decorated captain showed up in the third vehicle, f***ing up the already f***ed up traffic jam even further. A couple of drivers were forced to drive their otherwise deadlocked vehicles onto the sidewalk to clear the way for the captain. Almost one in the morning, luckily, there were no pedestrians. I knew it wasn't because no one was outside walking. Once late night pedestrians peeped it was the popo, They'd opt to take a detour on foot rather than encounter them. The cop crew was out there for almost an hour before they made a decision. Left Blue was out of the cruiser now, rerouting traffic around the cop beef. Right back seat Blue, the rookie, was still beside me, inflating with anger as he watched the uniformed cops fighting and losing in the loud negotiation he could see clearly through the cruiser windshield. Get the f*** out the car! The nice thick cop who had been driving and then arguing screamed on me. He had returned with the saltiness of an athlete who had just lost the NHL hockey championship game after an undefeated season and by only one shot. When I did not move, the still-seated rookie Blue pushed me forcefully, then jumped out of the cruiser himself. Now all uniforms were out of the car, standing in the street, leaning in on all sides, ordering me to move. I didn't speak. I didn't move. Left Blue had already said that if I moved one muscle, the next stop was the morgue. Pushed and then pulled and dragged out of the car where everyone could see me. I balanced myself on my feet, hands still cuffed tightly behind me. I was turned over to the two detectives in plain clothes, who walked on either side of me, then mashed my head down until I was seated in the back seat of their Plymouth. Doors slammed shut and they screeched off at a high speed for a short distance. Commotion at the 77th precinct. I was cuffed and seated. A fat-fingered cop attempted to type while another stood over me. Name? The fat cop asked me. I stared ahead, blank-faced. Name? He repeated, then paused, waiting for me to jump at his command. Name? The volume of his voice was steadily increasing. His fat head, flushed now with a maroon color. Jesus Christ! He exclaimed. Maybe we should name him Jesus Christ, the standing officer said straight-faced. And other cops, seated at their own desks, dealing with their own matters, laughed. 
Como se llama? An officer from across the room stood up from his desk and walked over to where I was being held. He was serious-faced, but even tempered. Seemed like he really suspected that he was speaking a language that I understood. But I didn't. De donde eres? He questioned, attempting to look me in the eye. I continued to stare forward, still blank. He's obviously not Spanish. The officer who had been standing over me the whole time said, They ain't got no Spanish people that black. No offense, Officer Ruiz. They clowned the Spanish-speaking officer for trying. Officer Ruiz didn't answer back to the ignorant cop. He probably knew what anyone with common sense knows. There are black-skinned people all over the world speaking any and every language that has ever been spoken. Just then, I recalled the Senegalese brother who I met in Tokyo. They spoke that Japanese fluently, like it was their father tongue. They could switch from speaking Japanese to Wolof, to Italian, to even German, like it was nothing. And they were black Africans, skin as black as mine. This asshole won't get the benefit of the doubt from me. He hears, and he understands, and he speaks English. Let me walk him into the side room. The uniformed cop standing over me said, he wanted a reaction, seemed to think I was supposed to start blabbering because he threatened to take me to the side room. That's all they can do, I thought to myself. I had emptied my pockets of a slim stack of hundreds, a thick pile of twenties, and of all of my personal belongings. I also handed my gym bag, my cash, and identification to my second wife and told her to bury it in a place that only she knew and where it could not be found. When she and I parted, I purposely had only my nine, three twenty-dollar bills and one clean white washcloth with me. Address, the obese typing cop asked me. Getting no response, he leaned back in his chair. I'll give you one more chance before I hand you over for your private meeting in the side room, he threatened. Address, he repeated. Date of birth, he switched his question. Completely frustrated, even though he had just got started, he pushed himself backwards and away from his desk. The chair wheels squeaking like they were alive and crying for mercy beneath his heavy weight. God damn it, throw him in the building cell till he talks, the fat-fingered cop concluded while blowing out a blast of hot air and rising up slowly, then wobbling away. The cop left standing over me leaned in close to my ear. His breath was the odor of shit, and his spit splashed out his venom. That guy there is a good cop, he said, referring to the fat motherfucker. The kind who gives knuckleheads like you a second chance. He cares whether you're a juvenile or not. That's why he wants your date of birth for your own good. He even takes care of his kids. Why don't you cooperate with him? Tell him when that bitch you call mama dropped a fatherless son of a bitch like you out of her filthy fucking hole. The fat cop looked back at the angry officer from across the room as though he wanted to know what the other had said to me. Then he disappeared. It's against the law to be outside without identification, the shit breath cop said, now looking down on me. And that's not the only charge you're facing. There's failure to stop and obeying officer's command, resisting arrest, fleeing from a crime scene. Then I knew. To hold me, they would grab at any charge. They would lie and make things up, and they did. I did not resist arrest. I did not defend myself. I have been silent and still. To me, that meant they were desperate and had not found the murder weapon yet or an eyewitness to the murder, or any solid evidence. Instead, they needed me to incriminate myself to make the major charges stick. Get up, the officer ordered. I stood. Behind bars, but no longer cuffed, it was crowded in their holding cell. Dudes hugging the bench the same way they do on the block. Cool. I walked to the far right corner and squatted, my back against the wall, 
What are my usual thinking positions? What size you wear? Some standing and staring at my joints asked me. I stood up like I was about to cooperate. Halfway to standing my back still against the wall, I kicked him and he flew backwards into the next man. He leapt up and now they were both glaring. I gave them the deadpan stare. Let's face it, we each knew we were all empty pockets and not holding. Hand to hand, they will have no wins against me. Besides, I knew they didn't want none. I could see it in their eyes. They did what punks do. They backed down and went back to their nonsense. One of them picked a new Vic. Maybe that guy will believe him. I didn't. Squatting again with my eyes wide open, I was traveling into my mind, setting and cleaning it up. First, I had to empty out my anger and the fury and the rage. It was much less than before the murder, no doubt, but even the amount remaining was a red fog that blocked me from precise, clear, and new thoughts. I was quietly inhaling and exhaling, shaking it off, lowering my blood pressure. At the same time, I was attempting to discipline my eyes to keep checking the clock that was lodged into the wall outside the cell. While in captivity, my sensei had taught me in one of my many private ninjutsu lessons, Never obsess over time. It is a form of self-torture. Use your memories of the past. Relive them in your mind. Stretch each memory out, even the ones that only lasted a few minutes in real life, and relive each one of those memories for days at a time. A man with no memories of happiness and pleasure or family, friendship, and adventure will be conquered by imprisonment, conquered by time, and conquered by his captors. Faces and bodies in the holding cell kept changing. Some were released, others transferred to hospitals or central booking or wherever. In the stench of blood, shit, and piss, my aim was to calm myself completely. I considered whether this was a physical battle or a mental one. I concluded that it was both. It had to be physical because I am confined. It had to be physical because I had been nightsticked and dragged and electrocuted by the cops. A mental battle, I had learned young, was tougher than a physical one. As I surveyed my surroundings, I was swiftly realizing that my mind, which was accustomed to being challenged, to learning and hearing various languages and actively solving problems and handling and conducting business and seeking out new and exciting things was now imprisoned in a small and dirty place with small-minded, stupid, crazy, and backward men who could neither learn anything nor teach anything or even communicate effectively to one another in their own English language. Their vocabulary was limited to mumblings, curses, insults, screams, and corruption, and there was no light to be had from any of them, the police or the captured. I told myself that my mental battle would be to keep my mind strong while being surrounded by the weak. I had to keep learning and growing day by day without any teachers or true examples. I had to remain active and increasing in knowledge. Moreover, I had to maneuver and outthink the cops. Even though I had considered owning up to the murder, I knew it mattered what I revealed and what I concealed and how much evidence I allowed him to collect and confirm. Yeah, I slaughtered the sucker. But the details of how that happened would determine how much time I would have to serve. The less time, the better. Especially when I murked a joker who was a lesser man. I know these Americans believe that all men are created equal. I don't. I believe all men are created. Period. And each man makes choices and takes action one way or another. What a man chooses to do or not to do is the only way to measure his worth. A man chooses to love 
is not equal to a man who chooses not to love. A man who builds is not equal to a man who destroys. A man who protects is not equal to a man who offends and assaults women, children, and defenseless people. A man who thinks and solves problems is not equal to a thoughtless man who makes mistakes, who makes mischief and problems, and who is himself a problem. Nah, not equal at all. How could a lazy man of excuses be equal to a hard-working man? How could an undisciplined man be equal to a man who is disciplined, who is straight, who resists temptation, addiction, and gluttony? He can't be equal. Those are my thoughts, my beliefs, and my answer, and I'm 100% certain. So now that the lesser man is deceased, I thought to myself, I gotta accept my punishment for doing the murder deed. But that punishment should be equal to the worth of the man I slaughtered. The more worthless he was, the less time I should serve. That's justice to me. You! Let's go! A cop suddenly called me out. Put your hands between the bars. He cuffed me and then opened the gate to let me out. Escorted into a small room with a table, four chairs, and a video camera mounted on a tripod, I checked there was nothing but one blackened glass window, one same door to enter and exit, and no pictures or artwork or certificates or degrees displayed on the walls. There was a clock, though, embedded in the wall, large and circular, and impossible not to notice or watch. Matter of fact, the precinct had clocks everywhere. For the cops, time is money, I thought to myself, recalling the rookie officer who was amped to be making overtime pay while dealing with my arrest and questioning in the dead of night. They loved the clocks, because with every tick-tock, they was earning and no one else is making money while they're in here except them. To the prisoner, the clock is a slow poisoning, a device that confirms a man's loss of control over himself, loss of control over his time. My sensei was correct. Staring at the clock just confirms the distance between a prisoner and his family and loved ones. Concentrating on that was a useless losing strategy. New faces, one uniformed and two plainclothes cops, came in calculating with their coffee cups in their hands. One of them threw a brown bag onto the table. The other cop opened it and pulled out a burger. I could tell from the smell. It was wrapped in a white greasy paper and accompanied by a red and white paper dish filled with fries and a can of grape soda. Sit down. The uniform cop ordered me. I sat. We get that you ain't the talkative type. We got that you ain't got no name because you're a nobody. We agree. You are a nobody. We don't even want you here. But there's only one way out. Give us the name and location of your bosses. If you don't want to talk, just write it down. He pulled out a small pad of paper and a half pencil with no eraser laid them down on the table, then pushed them over to my side. I didn't reach for them, didn't move. We sat in silence. I didn't know what the f*** he was talking about anyway. My bosses? Holy ish, it's 4 a.m. The uniform cop said with intensity. We can transfer you out to a place where no matter how sleepy you get, you'll be afraid to shut your eyes for fear of some nut crawling into your little boy. He was I didn't react. I didn't say anything or move one muscle in my face or body. Your silence is assuring us that you are guilty. You did something criminal and you know it. One plain clothes cop said. There is a bunch of shit that we can pin on you. A busy Friday night in Brooklyn. A perp won't talk. Got no name. Got no address. Got no identification. Six dollars. No alibi. No defense. We can match you up with anything from pickpocketing to murder one. But that's not what we're trying to do here. We want the truth. The name of the players. If I was you, I'd start talking real fast and real soon. Plain clothes number one said. 
I'll handle this. Plain clothes number two said to number one. You must be hungry, he said to me, pushing the burger towards me and moving the grape soda within my reach. Inside, I was laughing. These were the type of cops my man Amir had told me about who would come around the high school asking students to participate in the police lineup in exchange for a lemonade and a bologna sandwich. Like a police lineup was some type of legitimate after-school job and the police were friendly neighborhood employers. So what you do? I had asked Amir. You know, I had to fatten up the reward. Them other cats went up for the free lunch. I talked them up to 60 bucks for each of my appearances. What if you would have got picked up as the face that fit the crime? I asked. Nah, the cop told all of us, if you're not guilty, you got nothing to worry about. And something to gain. Besides that, it's impossible. Ain't nobody got a handsome face like mine. Amir choked. Now this Brooklyn detective, who must have thought he was better than the blue boys because he got to wear his own cheap clothes to work, was trying to buy me with a beef burger. Guess they thought the same sh** worked on every man the same way. It didn't. Mystery novels I had enjoyed reading taught me more than a few things about the American law. These cops had 48 hours to book me on charges and stand me before a judge. All of the charges they had mentioned so far were bullshit. Although, they were good enough for them to use falsely to book me. However, even they wanted more. I wanted them to hurry up and charge me and move me and get it the f*** over with. Still, I wasn't going to help them to do it. Not going to eat. Well, we'll see how long that's going to last. Take one bite of this burger and you better be ready to give me something. Names, bodies, drugs, weapons. He left. The others followed him out. The door clicked closed when the last one exited. So what I was cuffed and locked in a side room. I wasn't sweating this burger or fries. I had already eaten after the murder and right before my arrest. The thought of my last meal threw my mind into rewind. I was alone, just me and my memories, and that was cool with me. Folks, unfortunately, I gotta pause for the cause because I need you all to tune in to the next edition of Ralph Reads. I would like, or rather love, to thank you, fellow royalty, for stopping by. If you would like to leave a small donation or link with me on social media, please connect with me over to www.solo.com dot to forward slash rgmc 2407 please visit the music channel with the same ig and twitter handle right here on youtube at rgmc 2407 and take a chance and join the channel t-u-r-n the united ronin networks today we are ronin fellow royalty pick up a good book read a good story and set your good self free I appreciate you and I love you like cooked food. I will see you folks on the next edition of this Sister Soldier miniseries on Ralph Reed's. Ooh, child, shit really do get wild.